Friends, please pray with me. Father, we pray that you would bless the reading and the preaching of your most holy word. Continue to challenge us, convict us, build us up and encourage us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The subject of family comes with mixed emotions for many of us. For some of us, our families give us great pleasure and joy, encouragement. For others of us, our family is the source maybe of our greatest hurt. And for many of us, we might fall somewhere in the middle. The topic of family is, well, it's complicated. Johnny Carson once said back when he was hosting The Tonight Show on NBC, that Thanksgiving is an emotional holiday. People travel thousands of miles to be with people they only see once a year. And then they discover that once a year is way too often. But there's no doubt about the fact that your family has a massive influence on the person that you will become. Two families from the state of New York were studied very carefully by sociologists and historians. One was the Max Jukes family, and the other was the family of the Puritan Jonathan Edwards. And the thing that they discovered in the study was remarkable, but not completely surprising. Like begets like. Your family shapes your identity, and it informs your trajectory. Max Jukes was an unbelieving man, and he married a woman of like character who lacked principle. And among the known descendants, over 1,200 were studied. 310 of them became professional vagrants. 440 physically wrecked their lives by a debauched lifestyle. 130 were sent to prison for an average of 13 years apiece, and seven of them for murder. There were over 100 who became alcoholics, 60 became habitual thieves, 190 public prostitutes. And of the 20 who learned a trade, 10 of them learned that trade in the state penitentiary. It cost the state $1.5 million, and they made no contribution to society whatsoever. About the same era, the family of Jonathan Edwards came onto the scene Edwards, a man of God, married a woman of like character. And as their family began, so did the trajectory of many lives. Of those studied, 300 of his relatives became clergymen, missionaries, or theological professors. A hundred others became college professors in other fields. Over a hundred became attorneys, with 30 of them being judges. 60 of them became physicians. Over 60 of them became authors of classic books. 14 became presidents of universities. There were numerous giants in American industry that emerged from this family. Three of them became United States congressmen, and one became a vice president of the United States of America. There's no doubt about the fact that your family is one of the most substantial pieces of your identity. Your family shapes you in many ways and has the ability to set you on a trajectory even before you know it. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus talks about the nature of his family. And I want to ask you to turn your Bible uh, to Mark 3, and we're going to read a long section, Mark 3, verse 7 through 35, and a number of different accounts and interactions. We'll spend most of our time toward the latter half there in verses 20 through 35, as Jesus speaks about the markers of his family identity. And as you read the section, I want you to notice the different responses that people have to Jesus. You have some people who think that they are part of God's family, but they aren't. You have others who want to be, but they don't know if they can be. Then there are some people who are part of Jesus' physical family, but 
at this point, not part of his true family. And then there are those who he says are part of his true family. And it begs the question, it's the question for you today, are you part of God's family? Not just in proximity, but are you part of his true family? And how do you know for sure? Jesus tells us. Let's look at Mark 3, starting at verse 7. It says that Jesus withdrew with the disciples to the sea. And a great crowd followed from Galilee to Judea and Jerusalem and Edomia and beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And he told his disciples to have the boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God! And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. And he went up to the mountain and he called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and to have authority to cast out demons. He appointed 12. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the names Boandrus, that is, the sons of thunder. It's a pretty cool nickname, by the way. Andrew and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. And then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they said, he is out of his mind And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebub. And by the prince of demons, he casts out demons. And he called to him and he said to them in parables, how could Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan is has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mother? And my brothers. And looking around about the, those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus' ministry is expanding rapidly, and right away you see a very interesting observation when you think about all the characters involved in those four or five accounts that we just read. The observation is about how and who is responding to him. Those who are far away from him are pursuing him and drawing near. And those who are near to him are actually pushing him away. And somewhere in the middle are his true followers, his disciples. Let's consider the ones who are far, the far off ones who are drawing near. This is the crowd. They want to be part of God's family, but they don't know if they can be. 
They're experiencing wonder and fear. Jesus performs more miracles, and it says the crowds became so great as they followed him because the miracle worker was there. People were being delivered of what ailed them. Jesus was shown to do things that no one else could do. Diseases were being eradicated within bodies, and demons were being cast out. And what results is an excited mob. Anyone and everyone with a disease or an ailment comes just to simply reach out and touch him. And the crowd pressed so hard that Jesus has his disciples derive an exit strategy on a boat because they were in danger of being crushed. This was more than the popularity of a modern day singer after a great performance. This is more than people who hang around the baseball stadium after the game to get an autograph. These people's lives were being changed and they were doing anything and everything they could to draw near to him. We don't know who they thought Jesus was, but they wanted the benefit of being close to him. They were far off, but they were drawing near. And then comes an interesting string of accusations that culminate in the question of the day. Who is my mother and my brother? and my sister. Who is part of my real family? The demons in verse 11 say that you are the son of God. As the wonder captured the crowd, the demons give an orthodox expression of who Jesus actually is, but it's not met with a faithful following of him as their king. They're scared because they know his power. And then comes his family, verses 20 and 21. Mark introduces the story about his family, and then he interrupts it with another story about the scribes. And then he comes back to the family again, and he does so to make a point. The way that Jesus responds to the scribes informs how he views his true family. And so the family is not real fond of the notoriety that Jesus was gaining and the controversies surrounding his ministry. And it says in verses 20 and 21, they went out to seize him for they were saying he is out of his mind. Clearly what's happening here is not normal behavior. (laughs) Said the ones who knew him the best. The ones who were closest to him said, he's crazy. I mean, I've seen crazy, but this guy is crazy. And so the word here, to seize him, literally means to physically restrain him. His mother and his brothers were trying to physically restrain him to stop him from what he was doing. Now, we could rabbit trail with all kinds of fascinating theories about how they grew up with this guy and witnessed Jesus as the perfect son of God and still come to this conclusion. Or Mary, the mother of Jesus, getting to the point where she thinks her own son is crazy. Hmm. You can chew on that over lunch later. They're not successful. His family, the closest ones to him, are actually very far off in this moment. Proximity to Jesus doesn't guarantee faith in Jesus. Remember that, (laughs) that's part of the warning. Proximity to Jesus doesn't guarantee faith in Jesus. You can be near and still not part of the true family. Practically, you can participate in the life of a church and not be part of his real family. You can do religious things and not be part of his family. Proximity to Jesus doesn't mean, doesn't guarantee faith in Jesus. And so you're starting to see a variety of responses. He can heal me, those who are far away but drawing near. He's the son of God, the demons who refuse to draw near. He's out of his mind. His family, 
who are physically near but spiritually very far away. And then you see the most sinister of the opposition, and it comes from the religious leaders. Now remember, this whole section of Mark is colored by the verse that happened just before our reading for today. Do you remember it? Verse 6, it says that the Pharisees went out immediately and held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. The religious leaders of the day now have seen Jesus' power, they've seen his claim and authority to forgive sins, and they said, we are going to destroy him. And the word gets out. And as they've been trying to undermine what he's been doing, they come now to their most pointed and ridiculous accusation. He's possessed by Beelzebul. Beelzebul is another name for Satan. Now, if anybody should be near to Jesus, it would be his physical family, and yet they accuse him of being crazy. If anybody should be near to Jesus, it should be the religious leaders. I mean, after all, they facilitate the worship of God, and he is God (laughs) among them. But that's the peculiar thing about this passage. Those who are supposed to be near are actually far, and those who are far are drawing near. They're saying that Jesus and his work is from the devil. There isn't a worse accusation than that, and I don't know if it's one that they thought through all that well. (laughs) They accuse him of playing for the opposite team, working against the purposes of God, of being satanic in his activities. And so you see that faith is not the automatic response to see miracles of God. I mean, these Pharisees have seen the miracles. They don't respond in faith. Some love the acts of Jesus, but they don't have faith. Others misdescribe the source of his power, which you might say is an opposition to faith. And so Jesus gives them a stern warning and shows them why their accusation is absurd. Reason number one, Jesus can't be from Satan because a house divided against itself won't stand. The logic's really simple. I can't be from Satan because a kingdom divided against itself won't stand. A house divided against itself won't stand. Satan can't be divided against itself if he is going to continue to stand. Reason number two, Jesus can't be from Satan is because he is the stronger man. He gives this allegory of the strong man to describe the work of Satan and the work of Jesus. The strong man is Satan who possesses a bunch of people. He draws them in. He's captured them as his own to do his will. People who live in darkness, people who live under his lordship, the lordship of the Lord of the earth. And in this case, some people who are possessed by demons. But Jesus is the stronger man who binds the strong man, Satan. He rescues the people. He frees them, loosing them of their demons. Now they can enjoy light, follow their new Lord and God. And as he will show in a minute, they can even have the opportunity to become part of his family. And that little allegory is a profound picture of what happens in salvation. Satan, the Lord of the earth, captures as many as he can in unbelief. And Jesus, the stronger man, rescues them. Rescues you. (laughs) Rescues me. You want to talk about people who are far off? (laughs) That's far off. And they have the opportunity to draw near because Jesus is the stronger man. The plot thickens, and there's a warning again about blaspheming the Spirit. It's a two-edged sword of good news and bad news. Look at it with me. The good news is this. Jesus says in verse 28, all sins will be forgiven of the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. 
we know that the broader message of the gospel of Mark is that Jesus has come to forgive sins. Regardless of how bad your sins are, regardless of how careless your words have been, regardless of how violent your posture has been against God, Jesus has come to forgive sins and he offers that forgiveness to you. That's the good news. The forgiveness comes by those who put their faith in him as their king. And the forgiveness is purchased by what he's going to do on the cross. And so the good news is that there's hope for anyone, anyone and everyone who is far away to be forgiven through Jesus. But there is one sin that is unforgivable. He says it in verse 29. Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. So what is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and how do you know if you've committed it? (laughs) That's the question that we get asked with some regularity. Now remember the context of the story. Jesus announces the coming of his kingdom. He's showing that he has the power of the king. He's doing the works of God that are meant to display his kingly power and authority and glory so that people would recognize him, not just as their savior, but also as their king. The physical healings that Jesus is doing is pointing to his ability to eternally heal. The casting out of demons is pointing to his lasting spiritual purity and his ability to conquer the dark forces. But some, these Pharisees, are attributing this work of God to the devil. And the last part is the key to understanding what Jesus means. He says in verse 30, or it says in verse 30, for they, being the scribes and the Pharisees, were saying that Jesus has an unclean spirit. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is resisting the work of the Spirit in an ongoing active way, but it's more than that. It's resisting the work of the Spirit in unbelief and actually attributing that work to the devil. It's proclaiming that the good things from God are actually from Satan that the saving work of God is from the devil, that the eternal deliverance that Jesus offers is actually evil. That's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And Isaiah chapter five points to this when it says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So his physical family at this point is not his real family. They're pushing him away. The ones who should be his spiritual family are not his real family. They're the farthest ones away. They're blaspheming the spirit. And so who is the real family? Who's the real family of Jesus? And he tells us in verse 31. You see that His mother and his brothers came, standing outside, they sent to him, and they called to him. It's interesting that they were calling him. (laughs) Up to this point in the Gospel of Mark, the only one who's been doing the calling has been Jesus. And here, his family is calling him to get him to follow them. Moreover, when you see those who are looking for him or seeking him. That phrase, looking for him, is used 10 times in the Gospel of Mark. And every time it's used to show someone who's trying to gain some sort of control over Jesus. And in this instance, it's his family. His family is trying to assert their claim on him. It's as if they're saying, Jesus, remember whose name you carry. (laughs) Remember, you're one of us. You're part of this family, and this family doesn't do the crazy that you're doing. Come back. Follow us. And the posture of these family members is like some of the other followers. Some of them think that Jesus owes them something as part of their family. 
And so being told that his family's outside, his family who thinks he's crazy, he responds with these surprising words. Who is my family? (laughs) Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Seeing his deeds does not make you part of the family. Having close proximity does not mean you're part of his family. Having earthly relationships does not mean that you're part of his family. Faith in the Son of God and doing the will of God, that's what shows that you're part of the family of God. And it's interesting because everywhere else it seems like you hear the call to believe, 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 believe. And here we see the call to do, to do God's will. And friends, you need to know that these things are inextricably linked to each other. They are in some ways one and the same. Belief and obedience are the opposite sides of the same coin. You can't do the will of God unless you believe in Jesus. And you can't believe in Jesus without doing the will of God. There's no such thing as believing in Jesus, truly believing in him, without following him in obedience. Now that's going to be a difficult thing for some of us to swallow. Whether we think about our own life or whether we think about the lives of somebody that we love. In our time, people are very sensitive about the idea that we must give a regular assurance of salvation. How can I know if I'm actually saved? And the reason for this is because so many of us struggle with perpetual guilt of our sins, with a fear that God won't actually forgive us like he says that he will, and that we're unworthy of the grace and the forgiveness that he offers. And when we feel that way, we're right at least half right. (laughs) Because none of us are worthy of God's grace. None of us are worthy of God's forgiveness. But that's precisely the point. God promises that for those who put their faith in Christ, they will be forgiven. But there's another part of this that's really important to consider. Because of the fear of taking away assurance, sometimes we actually provide false assurance. Sometimes we provide comfort to ourselves or to someone when there should actually be a strong sense of being disturbed about our spiritual state. Sometimes we soften the edges so much, claiming that we only need to yield to the king occasionally instead of kneel before the king perpetually. And that is precisely what Jesus is getting to here. Jesus is not primarily giving a word of encouragement. He's giving a word of warning. And the warning has some implications of encouragement. Because sometimes people look back to their own family, their upbringing in a church, or experience that they had when they were a child, or their regular church attendance, today and they say, I know who Jesus is. I'm part of the family. But perhaps they're wrong. So how do you know? How do you know if your faith is genuine? How do you know if you're part of the true family or just one who's enjoying proximity? Jesus tells us in verse 35, whoever does the will of God. So let's be clear. Doing the will of God doesn't save you. Faith in Jesus does. But doing the will of God is evidence that your faith is real. (laughs) It's really important to get that right. Doing the will of God doesn't save you. Works don't save you. Faith does. But doing the will of God is evidence 
that you have real faith. To put it another way, doing the will of God or obedience, as we might just simply say, is another way of saying that you recognize Jesus as the king and you follow him. The demons know who he is. They know he is the king, but they just won't bow the knee to him as the king. The Pharisees have seen the power. They won't bend the knee to him as the king. And even Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was visited by an angel for a miraculous birth, that the savior of the world was coming. Even Mary in this moment says he's crazy, which is another way of saying, I'm not yet willing to bend the knee as the king. But Jesus rejects the rejectors. We won't follow you as king. And he says, I won't allow you into my kingdom. And so the question for me and the question for you is this, do you simply know who Jesus is or do you follow him as your king and thus obey him by doing the will of God in your life. Because faith in the Son of God and doing the will of God show that you're part of the family of God. The ones who are supposed to be close are not. The ones who are far off can draw near and become part of his true family. And he contrasts the crowds who see the miracles, the family who accuses him of being crazy, the scribes who claim he's from Satan, And in the middle of all that, he calls his disciples. The ones who make no such claims over him, but are commissioned to do his will, to follow him. They're the ones who will preach. They're the ones who have authority. Those who reject Jesus are replaced. And it's interesting that the religious leaders of Israel are replaced by a bunch of nobody fishermen, tax collectors, and laborers. 12 of them representing the patriarchs of Israel. These 12 nobody has now become the spiritual fathers of the church. New patriarchs, new spiritual leaders. Jesus replaces those who rejected him. And the same holds true for his family. Those who reject him are replaced, his mother and his brothers, replaced by those who will do the will of God. They are my mother and my brothers and my sisters. Now, thankfully, we know that many of those mothers, that mother and those brothers come back and follow him and he receives them. But so it is with you and everyone else who follows him. Faith in the son of God and doing the will of God show that you are part of the family of God his family, the most important relationships in life, the identity forming relationships, the relationships that put you in a trajectory for the future. You can be part of the family. (laughs) And that means the good news here, in the midst of warning, the good news is wonderful. The family of God does not have an impossible barrier to entry. Jesus lowers the barrier to entry to let you in. It means that it's possible for anyone who has faith to enter, regardless of what you've done in the past, your past sin, your blasphemies, your ethnicity, your, your, uh, how far off you've been, Jesus makes the way. It means that regardless of how dysfunctional your earthly family is, that you are not bound to that dysfunctional trajectory because there's an eternal family that welcomes you in and you will have the benefit of a perfect, loving father and the purposes of his good pleasure. It means that obedience is part of this family relationship. The ones who say they believe, but then live in contradiction to this king are not part of the family. The ones who believe truly will obey this Jesus as their king. Andrew Murray once wrote, the true pupil, say of some great musician or painter, 
yields his master a wholehearted and unhesitating submission. In practicing his scales or mixing the colors in the slow and patient study of the elements of his art, he knows that it is wisdom simply and fully to obey. It is this wholehearted surrender to his guidance, this implicit submission to his authority, which Christ asks. We come to him asking him to teach us the lost art of obeying God as he did. The only way of learning to do a thing is to do it. The only way of learning obedience from Christ is to give up your will and to make to him and to make the doing of his will the desire and the delight of your heart. You might feel like following the will of God in your life, the instructions of God are not possible. You might feel like maybe they're not applied to you. It might be a mistake, but there's no mistake. If the Lord himself commands it, he empowers it, and he empowers it to the point of obedience. And here you find the greatest joy, the greatest benefit, the greatest family underneath the banner of the king. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can be part of the family of God. It is my sincere prayer that our joy would be found as part of this family today. Father, we thank you that you make clear the boundaries of this family. And I pray for any among us who have not yet surrendered their will to Jesus as their king, that today they would indeed do that to see themselves clearly before you as they are, to revel in the grace that you offer, to reach out and take hold of it for the forgiveness of sins and to follow faithfully as a member of your family. God, the opportunity that we have is priceless. It's rooted in your love and we express our love to you now in Jesus' name, amen. So what do you do with a message like this? Warning, warning, encouragement, I think the thing that you do is you walk away and in self-examination, you say, am I doing the will of God? <laughs> and in the ways that you're not, you have really two options. You can say, I'm gonna be angry about the fact that I was confronted with that and I'm gonna keep doing my own thing. Or you could say, in the ways I'm not following the will of God, I wanna repent and turn and do the will of God. That's what you do with a message like this. Self-examination and the appropriate gratitude for the opportunity to be part of God's family and the appropriate repentance in the ways that you're showing that you're not. If you have a prayer request or want to repent with somebody and pray with somebody, there will be people down here this morning to pray with you and to encourage you. As you go, hear these good words that God actually empowers us to be faithful and obedient to him. The book of 1 Thessalonians ends this way. It says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. God bless you. We love you. Have a great week.